We are going to be in Psalm 121 today. And if you have a Bible, there's some under the chairs. There's, um, there's a couple still on the Welcome Center. There's blue Bibles on the Welcome Center. We give those away. They're free. They're yours for the taking. If you know somebody who needs a Bible, grab it, take it, give it to them. I'll put some more out. We buy them to give them away. So if you need one, take a Bible. Take it and be a blessing. Give it to somebody. That's what we want. Uh, if you brought a phone, iPhone, iPad, Android, the Version Bible app, that's the one I'd recommend. Works fantastically well. But we're going to be in Psalm 121 for the majority of today. Now, as you, as you go shopping, you, you may often hear, as I hear, these words, right? May I help you? You hear that when you go into various stores. It's a familiar greeting when you, when you go in. And, and if you've ever, I've worked in retail, if you've worked in retail, you, you know those words. May I help you? Or, or some variant thereof, right? Um, when I... I've worked at so many jobs in my life. When I worked at Wendy's, I used to work at Wendy's, we had a specific thing we had to say every time somebody come through the drive-thru, right? And so you had to learn how to say it that way. When I, when I worked at Red Lobster, and I worked at Red Lobster for a lot of years, we had a specific way we were trained that we were supposed to greet tables, and so you would approach the table in a specific way. And, and wherever it is, whether it's Walmart or whatever, this may I help you is this question that you often find in these retail settings. Now, when my wife and I got married, we went on our honeymoon to Mexico. And of course, as part of that, we went to Cancun. And as part of that, um, you, you tend to usually at some point in time land in one of the markets, right? So we go down to the Mercado and, and we're there buying stuff like, like tourists buy stuff, looking to buy some, some souvenirs and some trinkets. And, and my wife is an art teacher, so we bought art. Um, we bought a... Uh, decorative mirror and all kinds of crazy stuff that were difficult to get through um, through when we were coming back into the country. We had a challenge to, to get everything allowed back in. We had so much stuff, but that's okay. We eventually got it all through. But as, as we were there shopping and I'm thinking about it, I began to think, wow, these guys are really eager to sell me something, right? And, and at every transaction, it's a barter. And I'm just not a bartering kind of guy, right? It's just not me. I like the new car dealers that have, here's the price, take it or leave it, right? I like that. I don't want to barter. I don't want to bargain. If, in fact, I could have just grabbed one of the guys working at the market and paid him like 20 bucks or 40 bucks or 50 bucks and just given him a list and said, go buy me these things, I would have loved that. That would have been awesome. And in fact, I think I probably would have gotten better deals in the long run anyhow and probably saved that much money, Right? Um, we'll tell you the story about a cross that we bought we paid way too much for um, some other time. But uh, that's what we do. And of course, each merchant, they're saying, oh, no, 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 mine's the best. Come over here. Don't talk to that guy. You ever been there in Mexico? I mean, it, it, it's, it's cutthroat. Oh, he's ripping you off. I'll give you a better price. Come over here. Hey, come here. Right? It, it, it's crazy. It, it's quite the experience. It's a lot of fun. Um, if, if you go to Mexico, I do recommend trying it at least. Um, it's interesting. But I, as I said, I'm not big on bar- bartering. And it seems, at least in my experience here in this world, that we begin to slowly transition from kind of that, that barter and service economy. Once upon a time, everywhere was kind of like that, right? You'd come to the market, you'd bring your chicken or you'd bring your egg, and you'd barter and trade that for somebody's pork chop or a, a little bit of milk or some salt or some sugar or whatever it might be. And, and, and as a society, we've begun to change away from that kind of bartering and service oriented the, the may I help you mentality, a lot of that is starting to go away. Places like McDonald's are becoming more and more automated to the point at which eventually they're not going to have people that even answer. You're just going to pull up in the drive through and talk to a robot or touch a screen and it'll take your order and no people will be involved. And, and that's the future, automation, robotics. That, that's where I think the world is starting to head. So as uh, a number of years ago now, I moved to Wasika. That was the first place I served a church. In 2008, we moved there. We got to town. I pulled into a gas station, and I heard ding, 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 ding as I pulled in, in my car, right? Who knows what those ding, dings mean? You older folks know it, right? So I pulled in, and it goes ding, 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 ding. And I was like, did I just hear that? And sure enough... 
out comes this guy, the rag out of his pocket, comes running out of the shop. And runs up to my window and says, what do you want? I'm at a gas station. I want gas, right? Uh, but, you know, I, I understand. I, I've, I've seen this before. But when was the last time you were at a full-service gas station? It's been a while for most of us, I suspect. So when I moved into this town in 2008, I'm like, these still exist? Wow, right? So I was like, well, uh, fill her up, right? I, I'm, I, I, I experienced this in childhood. My, my grandmother went to a Sinclair, and only to this Sinclair, because they still, to her dying day, would fill her car, would check her oil, and would check the air in her tires, which I always thought was a little ironic because my grandfather was a car mechanic, but yet she made them do it every single time. I don't understand that math, but that's how it worked. And back in the day, they used to have, you know, here's, here's one you'll remember. You'd go to the grocery store, and there would be a young man standing at the end of the, the aisle, and he would know exactly how to load your stuff in the bag so it wouldn't destroy all of your other stuff. And then he would take it and put it in these special carts, and then regardless of how it was snowing or sleeting or raining or hailing in Minnesota, he would walk out to the car with you and place them in your trunk for you, right? All you had to do was walk. It was awesome. We've lost that, though, haven't we? Those, those days are gone. I do still know of one. Unfortunately, the Waseca gas station, it closed while we lived there. If you happen to go through Tabor, South Dakota, there is a gas station still that you cannot pump your gas. They will not let you. It's part of their service. Other than that, anybody else know of a full-service station? or Ah, uh-uh. they, they've disappeared. They've gone the way of the dinosaur, right? And so we used to be much more dependent on others for those types of services. Um, it was almost like we needed that help. We didn't. I mean, we get by today. But it felt like we kind of needed that help. But in this world, we find that relying on other people will eventually let us down. Things change, people change, and others eventually will fail us. Even if something has a lifetime warranty, right? Well, what happens when that company goes out of business? What sort of lifetime are we talking about? The lifetime of the company, not of my ownership. And so people will fail us. But there is, and this is my big point today, someone who will not. Someone that we can turn to for our help that is infinitely and eternally reliable. So as I said earlier, Psalm 121 is where we're going to be if you'd like to turn to that. As I read through Psalm 121, each time I come to this passage of Scripture in my Bible reading, I, I'm comforted. It is one of the most comforting passages I find anywhere in Scripture. Um, some, some of the scholars have labeled this as a, a traveling psalm. Um, you'll notice if you've got notations in your Bible, at the very beginning it might say, a song of ascent, right? A song that the people of Israel might have sung as they were walking up and, and approaching the temple in Israel. A song that they would have sung as worship, entering into that place of great worship. A song that would have been a comfort for travelers who were undoubtedly often very weary. A song that would have reminded them of, of God's protection for them as they traveled. So as we look at this today, I can hear God saying, may I help you, right? And the first thing that I, I hear and I see as I read through this is that, that God is greater than anything, okay? You know, people and things will eventually all let us down. There will always be someone who doesn't come through for us. I mean, if you're a sports fan as, as I am, you, you know these guys that are called clutch players, right? These are, these are the guys who supposedly come through in the clutch. And when the game is on the line, you want the ball in his hand, you want the puck on his stick, you want him to be the kicker to kick it through the uprights. He wasn't the Vikings kicker last year, right? That's why he's no longer the Vikings kicker. But you want that clutch player at the plate when it's tied. We're about to go into extra innings. There's a man on base and there's two outs. That's the guy you want at the plate. But you see, here's the problem. If you follow sports, you know this. Even the most clutch player, I don't care if you're talking about Kobe Bryant, 
Joe DiMaggio, uh, uh, doesn't matter. Gary Anderson, who was one of the greatest kickers in the history of football, they all miss. They all fail. They're not perfect. But you see, there is one who is. God never lets us down. You see, God is the clutch player of all clutch players. He's the one who bats a thousand percent. He's the one who never swings at the bad curveballs and hits them out of the park every single time. He doesn't strike out. Verse 1 says this. It says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come from? Now in that time, hills were associated with pagan worship. At the the top of many of these hills were, were centers of worship of gods other than the one true Yahweh God. And so the, the, the writer is saying that when he looks up to these hills, when he looks up, he sees these, these other gods. He sees these altars to these false gods. And when he looks up to them, he sees no help. There's nothing there to help him. Now, of course, as Christians, we, we kind of snicker a little bit at... Uh, people who might bow down before a pole or, or worship the sun or, or worship a tree. You know, we kind of look at that and go, that's a little weird, isn't it? But the truth is, even us, that we often look for help from sources other than the one true God. You know, we may, we may seek help from many different things. It's not just drugs or or alcohol or sex that I'm talking about. So often, we can allow our jobs to be our source of help, right? We can allow our job to be the thing that we think is helping us. We look at our family for help. We look to our children even sometimes for help. Or maybe you, you look to Dr. Phil or whoever is the popular guy on TV at the moment, right? We look to things that are temporary and unable to actually truly help us. But you see, Scripture is abundantly clear that that God is greater than any of that stuff. Our help doesn't come from anything other than God. Now verse 2 gives us the answer. It says, My help, it comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. You see, God created all of the stuff that we depend upon. God created the church. God created our families. God created the universe. And so I think it's a better idea to go to the source, to go to the creator, than to try to find and get our needs met from something in his creation. Back at the uh, turn of the 20th century, there was this inventor, right? And he had invented this new machine. He built several of these machines, and... And and one factory bought one of these machines. And this machine worked quite well for a period. But after a while, as mechanical things go, it started to break down. It started to not work right. And so the engineers at this company, they came in and they looked at the machine and and they turned some knobs and they moved some bolts and they tried to replace some parts. But, boy, this machine just, it wouldn't run right. They did everything they could to figure it out. But finally they had to admit to the owner... Boss, we're stumped. We can't fix it. You better call the inventor. So he called the inventor. Says, hey, can you come out and help us? Sure. Be right there. The inventor comes out, looks at the machine, stands there for a couple of minutes looking at it. Got out one tool, walks over to it, tinkered for a couple of minutes, turned to the owner and said, your problem solved. The inventor handed the owner a bill for, at the time, a huge sum of $100. Now remember, this was well over 100 years ago. And $100 was a ton of money back then, right? And the owner looked at this bill, and he goes, $100? You only tinkered around in this thing for like two minutes. The inventor replied, yeah, it's $10 for tinkering and $90 for knowing where. Right? Right? When we need help, it only stands to reason to go to the one who created it to begin with, right? The inventor knew more about the machine than anyone because he was the one who built it. God knows more about what we need because he created us. And it's funny in a, in a sad sort of way that all the places that we turn to, all the places that we run to, 
to try to meet our needs. Yet, here we have a God who longs to meet our needs. Often as we run to those other things, we do it as we run from the one who created us. A sad story on the state of where many of us often find ourselves to be. Now, of course, you know, I like to play God. Or I like to pretend like I'd like to be God, at least. Any of you ever have those experiences? Where you think, if I was God, I would do this so differently. There'd be a lot fewer mosquitoes. Um, There's a number of other things I would change. But as I see these people, I want to say, you fool, why are you running to this, that, and the other thing, right? Why are you running to these things when you could run to the Creator God? I mean, if I was God, I would actually be laughing at them and probably smiting them and doing things like that to keep myself entertained. I'd be a terrible God. I would. Remember Jim Carrey on Evan Almighty or whichever one it was? I'd probably be a horrible God like that, right? Thankfully, I'm not God. And, and that reaction to people's silliness in no way reflects our God. Because God waits for us. God longs for us to just turn to Him. To fully rely upon God. And then in verse 3 and 4, it tells us that God looks out for both the individuals as well as the group of people. Israel is God's people. We are God's people. And He watches out and watches over us as a group. He cares for our personal needs. Jesus said this in Matthew 6. He said that the lily of the field, it it doesn't labor for its beauty, right? If, If God gave them such beauty, the lilies, will he not then so much more provide for us? Jesus went on to say, Your heavenly Father knows what you need, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. God protects those who follow him and love him. Now, of course, that's not saying that if we follow and love him, bad things can't happen to those who follow God. But God will provide for those who are faithful to him. Doesn't mean it'll always be easy, though. I mean, as a pastor, I've seen some amazing men and women of faith go through incredibly trying times. The Apostle Paul himself is a great example, right? Paul, this great man of faith working hard to plant churches to spread the gospel. Yet, Paul is shipwrecked twice. He's stoned, I mean, with rocks. He's nearly beaten to death. He's jailed and then eventually executed for simply doing what God had called him to do. So we're not promised a smooth ride in the here and now. Nothing is necessarily going to stay and be always easy when we become a Christian. But as it says then in verse 5, it says that the Lord watches over you. And he is your keeper. That you effectively don't have to go this road alone. You see, Christ came to earth as an absolute tangible evidence that God will not abandon us. And not only that, Christ then when he left, when he resurrected and and ascended to heaven, he leaves with us the Holy Spirit. That we, his bride, the church, might be empowered for great things. That's what the church is for. The church is so that we might gather and be encouraged and to be built up. So that we aren't alone in our faith, facing our problems all by our lonesome. And I love the imagery that's evoked by calling the church the bride of Christ, right? Just as the the groom, I I performed a wedding just um, Friday. Went up to the North Shore and and a a young lady from my previous church uh, has found a, a delightful husband and... They invited me to go up and and do their wedding in two harbors. And it was beautiful on the shores of Lake Superior. They thought it was like 80% chance of rain. Not a speck. Standing on the shores of Lake Superior for the whole wedding. It was great. There was a little sprinkling before, a little sprinkling after. Not a speck while we were out doing the wedding. It was glorious. And, And as I spoke with them during their message, I talked about what it is, the sacrifice Christ made for the bride of Christ. For the church. That is us. 
And as the groom cares for his bride, as the the groom groom loves, and as the groom provides for his bride, so too does Christ, but more and more and all the better. Now, of course, there's a whole other sermon there, and I'm not going to preach that today because many of you want to go barbecue and blow up small pieces of our country, which is okay. Enjoy the 4th of July, or the 2nd, as it may be. But it is beautiful imagery of how God has provided for us. Another thing that I see in this passage is that not only will God provide for us, but that he protects us as well. Look at verse 6. And as you look at verse 6, don't take this as God saying, you know, something like, don't use sunscreen, that the sun shall not strike you, right? The sun will get you. If you're out in your bass boat on the lake in the sun, put on sunscreen. That's not what this is talking about. But what it is talking about is that not only will God protect you, but he will be with you, providing for you and protecting you simultaneously. That God is always with you in all things, wherever you might go. This is the idea that God is there. Even in those times, and I've had those times, where God might feel distant. My experience when God feels distant, it's because I'm the one who's been distancing. God hasn't moved. I'm the one who's been running. But scripture tells us God is always there. And that, in fact, that the sun can't strike us, nor the moon by night, right? You're not going to get like moon burn or anything like that. But it's kind of like, you ever met this guy? I've met these guys. It's that little brother, the runt of the litter, right? Who's always ready to fight you. Who's always ready to, to just, you know, have at it with you. As long as his bigger, older brother's right behind him, right? That's the only time he actually really wants to throw down. If the older brother's there, great. If not, nice to meet you. How are you, sir? Right? But God is there. And God has our backs at all times. He is in it with us. I found myself wondering this week as I was working on this sermon how often it is that I've missed out on God's blessing in my life because... Frankly, I was unwilling to trust in him to protect and provide for me. I'm sure in both little things as well as in big things that I've missed out. But I am truly thankful for the times where that wasn't the case. Where God has blessed me in abundant and clear ways. How has God blessed you? How have you been at being faithful to him so that his blessing could flow into your life. As we read the, at the end of verse 6 there, I find it kind of strange that the writer would include this moon threat, right? Like, like I said, like moon burn, what is this? But, but you have to understand the idea behind lunar, right? The lunar, which you know, we associate with the moon, has the same root word as lunacy, or being crazy, Right? And there used to be a fear that if you were overexposed to the moon, this is where the stories of werewolves and stuff like this come from, if you had too much exposure, that it might make you a lunatic. It might make you lose your mind. So this verse is saying that God even protects us from perceived threats if we are simply faithful. That's what God wants from us. And then if you jump into verse 8, it tells us this. It says, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. I was just uh, talking the other day, uh, Don and Priscilla Ascension are, are planning a, um, what is it when you go on a boat? Cruise, that's the word I couldn't come up with this morning, thank you. And I'd heard they were taking a cruise, but they are taking a cruise an incredible cruise. You'll have to ask him about it. An amazing cruise. A, 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 a dream of a lifetime kind of cruise. And as I was talking with them, I, I began to have all these thoughts going through my mind and, and after, afterwards about what I would do and where I would go. And then, you know, I began to think about, well, on a trip like this, this is, this is like almost a month-long trip that they're going to be going on. Do you get insurance for that? Like travel insurance, Right. A lot of people do, a lot of people don't. 
You know, and, and I've heard these vacation horror stories where people get trapped in a boat, like in the Caribbean, and they run out of food and run out of gas, and everybody gets like some horrible illness, right? I've read those stories too. I'm thinking, what would I do if I was on a boat for 26 days and that kind of thing were to happen? Or, or maybe something happens and they have to dock at a country where they don't speak the language and they have to go to shore for a few days. What do you do? Right? I just started thinking through these because my mind goes to weird places. But I started thinking about what a nightmare that could be instead of what a wonderful trip it might be. But in life, we don't have to worry about that. In life, we have God with us. That doesn't guarantee it's not going to be a bumpy ride, but it does guarantee he's going to protect us along the journey. Take into consideration when the psalm was being put together. It was written back in the days when traveling to Jerusalem was dangerous. As you would travel the roads, you remember the story of the Good Samaritan. While that's a parable, there's still truth in it, right? And the stories of people being ambushed on the roads were ones that people understood. Yeah, when you go to Jerusalem, not all the ways to get there are necessarily a safe path. There are bandits. There are bad guys. There are people hiding in the bushes who are going to jump out and club you over the head and take your money, take your camel, take whatever you got. Out on these desert roads, it could be dangerous. And they'd leave you there for dead. And so the only thing that these travelers had to protect them was trusting that God would see them through. And then I think in that last bit of verse 8, that, that, that word there, at least in my Bible, it says forevermore, is so important. So important for us to remember. When we become children of God, when we become followers of Christ, His love for us is a never-ending, no-take-backs kind of love. God's protection, it doesn't ebb and flow. It's not like the tide that comes in and goes out. His protection, His love is permanent. And remember, God doesn't need a rest. After Jesus gave His disciples the great commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? And to all of the world. He finished with these words and He said, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When we are in God's will, we are in His protection. And that protection is permanent. That doesn't, again, mean bad things won't happen. It doesn't mean that we can do whatever it is that we want. But it means that nothing comes our way that will be more than we can handle with God. First Peter 5, 8 says this. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour someone. And we are reminded that God's power is greater than even that. Greater than anything. Greater than even the devil. Because all things were created by Him. And the Creator is vastly greater than the creation. Go back to verse 7 for just a second and then we'll wrap up. Verse 7 tells us this. It says, The Lord will keep you from harm or evil, as some Bibles translate it. And he will keep your life. See, we all have a purpose to fulfill on this earth. And that purpose is to live for the Lord. And he will protect us and fulfill us in that plan. Protection for his people. So are you one of his people? It's not simply just a matter of asking, asking for God to get us out of a tight spot. He doesn't want us just to call on Him when we're in a pickle, right? Many of us, our first prayers were before tests, right? Or before some trial. Even before I was a Christian, I used to pray sometimes before a test. God, help me out with this one, right? Or I was more likely to pray, God, help me get this girl to go on a date. That was the stuff I prayed for. Truthful. But either way, God doesn't want us just calling on Him when we're in a tight spiritual spot. He desires for us to be in this relationship that's ongoing. He wants us to depend on Him daily, to fully rely upon Him. And I'm confident in saying that everyone in this room has room for improvement in this category, right? Where are you not trusting God? 
Where are you missing out on blessings that God wants to bestow upon you because He is great, but you are missing out because you won't rely upon Him? Where do you think that you know better than God in your life? Is it your finances? Is it dealing with your children? Is it a relationship that's been torn or broken? Maybe God's speaking to you today, right here, right now, saying, bring it to me. Saying, quit trying to do it alone. Quit trying to go it alone. Give up control. Swallow your pride. Take it to God and see what amazing things can be done and what peace comes from it. God is waiting for you to trust Him and obey Him in all things. And when God asks us, may I help you? Our answer should simply be yes. Please, help me. Let Him have His way with you. You can't go wrong trusting God. He will protect us and keep us safe in His love. He won't let our foot slip while we are walking in His will. Ask God to guide and direct you and to show you His will. And if you do, He will be with you all of your days. Trust in the Lord. Everything else will fail you. Amen. Let's pray.